Thanks for tuning in this morning. First day of spring in the Northern Hemisphere and it feels like spring here in the Southern Hemisphere where we are because the honey is still flowing and we actually get quite good autumn First flows and winter Northern flows Hemisphere. here. It so like it's here uh, an exciting summer. time to be watching the honey come in, whether it be spring or summer or autumn. And look at that, it's flowing through and it's actually a little bit striped today because sometimes what you get is a couple of different uh, nectar types in the one frame, which is what we're seeing today. You get these stripes coming through, which is pretty cool to see. You've got some dark honey and some light honey uh, mixed in that frame. Often they'll keep it separate and you can really enjoy the separate flavors of each frame. Mm, it's absolutely pouring out and it's delicious honey. If you've got questions, put it in the comments and we'll answer them as we go, as we harvest this honey. Now I'm just gonna open up the side windows and have a look in here. That's a uh, frame that's got honey in it too. And look at this amazing artwork on this box by Sarah. She's quite the artist. She's gone and done an anatomy diagram here, which looks amazing. And around the other side, I just better switch this jar here. Oh, the honey's absolutely pouring out. Mm -mm. Have a look around the other side. I've got the life cycle of the bee up the top there. And then you've got the different types of bee in the hive. You've got the worker, the queen, and the drone. I actually took this hive to the school my son goes to and it was a great little educational piece for the kids to uh, learn a bit more about the honeybee. Any questions coming in? We'll, we'll jump right into it. If you've got questions, put it in the comments and we'll get to answering those. Today we're not running a, a mic on Instagram, but uh, we'll, we'll make do by filming nice and close. Right, so to the, uh, the million dollar question that always comes through on, on when we're doing the harvesting is honey, is how much honey are you gonna get out of one flow frame? Okay, out of one flow frame, we hope to get a six or seven of these jars, so about three kilograms worth of honey. Now it does depend on what the bees do, whether they've really joined onto the flow frames and built their wax out further to store even more honey in the frame, or whether they've capped it in flush. So sometimes you'll get less, sometimes you'll get more, sometimes you'll overflow a jar that holds three kilograms of honey. But most of the time, it's around that three kilogram mark or about two liters of honey. Beautiful. Oh, fantastic. And Cedar, so what makes it so dark, this one? Because other ones we've harvested have been really light. Yes, this, uh, these have, haven't been harvested in a while, these frames. And what I suspect it is, is the, um, the winter flowers mixed with a bit of spring because um, the winter flowers around here tend to have that dark red tone and then in the springtime what you get is the lighter tones and the lighter colors coming through so a bit of a bit of a mix but it's fantastic every frame you harvest will have different color and a different flavor and that was an unexpected joy of the flow hive we didn't really set out to be isolating different flavors and be able to really store different types of honey from the one hive it was an unexpected benefit that uh, came later look at that another jar Whoa. pouring out <laughs> the stay, onto stay it. on top of that cedar <laughs> yum Oh, this is a this is a nice comment from Loring Frank. They have a flow hive in Hollywood, Florida, overlooking Westlake Park. These are very happy and bees and producing lots of honey. Oh, great, great. Yes, spring. well, you know, giving them a good view. They can see where the flowers are, and they get way more honey. I actually, don't think it makes any difference. <laughs> but or the view. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the bees are doing well here, so maybe there's something in it. You know. <laughs> Okay, keep the questions coming in. The idea is we get to answer all your questions and if you've got answer to other people's comments, please chime in. That's what it's all about, providing a, a, a nice, uh, friendly environment for people to ask those questions that they might be afraid to ask. 
Great. Well, Caroline's asking, they're planning on moving house soon, and do they leave the flow super on top while we move it? Not sure where they are. Yes, normally we would move it with the flow super on top, unless the colony is really weak, in which case you might want to take the super off anyway. But if you've got a lot of bees in your hive, leave it all together. You'll be taking the gabled roof off. You put a strap right around the hive, nice and tight. And then my tip for moving hives, if you're moving it a long way and you need to transport it on a vehicle, is to get up nice and early before light, get your smoker out, add some wisps of smoke around the entrance, you don't need to blow it into the hive and the bees each time you add a bit of smoke will go into the hive so you want as many bees in the hive as you can and when there's no more left on the outside you can take the moment to block the entrance which you can do with a piece of steel wool or you could use our entrance reducer up the other way it is an entrance closure provided the boxes are nice and lined up that'll be a nice closure for your transport and if you're really worried we've even provided screw holes where you can screw that entrance reducer on to make sure those bees aren't getting out the front while you're transporting it now I recommend you transport it on a pickup or a trailer so that the bees aren't in the vehicle with you a lot of people do transport the bees inside their car it's a risk you're taking there if you have an accident it could be a nasty situation there with bees in your vehicle so um, I don't recommend it but often people will just wear their bee suit in the car but even so you're better off with it on on the back of a, a ute or on a trailer Great. See, the Ricky on TikTok is asking, how long does it take before you get honey? So that's the uh, question, and the answer is it really depends, like a lot of answers in beekeeping. If you have a good nectar flow with a really nice strong colony, then what you'll find is it happens quite quickly. And we get stories on the extreme end where they've put their colony in the box and and within that uh, next month they're harvesting from their flow hive and then two weeks later it's full again they harvest again and so on but on the other end of the extreme people might not get any honey that season perhaps the colony was a bit weak perhaps there wasn't a whole lot of things flowering in the area for the bees to forage on perhaps droughts or floods affected the flowering of the trees and the plants so it really does depend and I think as a bit of a, a guess, you'll be waiting at least a couple of months to get bees storing honey in your flow frames once they've uh, filled out the bottom box. So, and it also depends how you start. If you start with just a package of bees or a swarm, then they're going to need to spend some time building out this bottom box before you can even put the honey collection box, the super, on top. So. If uh, all goes well, you'll get your flow hive and in that season you'll be harvesting beautiful honey from your local area, which is just a great joy to be able to share. Great. Now, Happy Hounds and Island is asking, would harvesting the honey be different in the Northern Hemisphere? In the Northern Hemisphere, it is different and it's different even one hour's drive from here. So what the difference is, it's different floral species. The bees are the same. Humans have dragged the European honeybee, Apis mellifera, all around the world, wherever they've gone, because they're such epic pollinators and they just produce amazing amounts of honey. There's no other insect like it on the planet. So it's the same species of bee. These bees communicate in the hive by doing a dance and the bees on the other side of the world have exactly the same language. They're the same Apis mellifera species. So it's actually about what's flowering around you. So in some parts of the world, you'll get things that um, behave differently and there, there might be thicker viscosities, there'll be thinner ones, there'll be ones that are more prone to going candy in the hive. But because we're harvesting in the warmer months of the year, it pretty much is the same wherever you are in the world. So we've got people up in, the, up in Alaska, we've got people in Canada, we've got people in, in Europe and in the UK, in those colder regions, 
harvesting amazing honey and we've got people in the deserts, in the uh, tropical regions and so on. So amazing species of, of animal isn't it? The European honeybee is just incredible and so versatile that it can live almost anywhere. Not in Antarctica but there's no flowers there so <laughs> it's not really going to work for you if you're in Antarctica. Um, Laurie's just wondering, Callum, if um, you could show us again the side of that hive again. I, Laurie's tuning in on Insta and just missed that part. Just wanted to see the side of the hive and look at that beautiful artwork that Sarah, our awesome manager of customer support, did on that hive. I think some people think you can actually buy them with this artwork on it, but maybe they'd have to commission Sarah. This is a, this is a one-off special and a beautiful educational yeah. piece. I actually took it to my school that my kids go to, and it was a, a great, uh, great talking point for people to learn about the bees. You see here, we've got the worker bee, we've got the queen bee, and the drone with their relative sizes. And notice how the drone's eyes touch together in the middle, whereas the worker and the queen don't. And that's one way you can tell them apart. And also, the queen has thicker, bigger legs and a longer abdomen. And the also you've got here the egg and larvae stage, starting with the egg on the, the left up the top there. And then it grows in the cell, gets bigger and bigger, looks like a little croissant and gets fed by the worker bees. And on day 11, if it's a worker bee, it'll be, uh, it'll spin a silk cocoon around itself and the bees will help cap that off. It. And then it will be in its larvae stage for another 10 or 11 days before it emerges into the hive as a little fluffy bee ready to do the many chores of a worker bee's life. Fantastic. And look, just there's a few people tuning in. They want to know where to purchase them, how do they get them, um, the cost and things like that. Best way to do that is to contact our customer support team. Um, you can call them, email them, and they'll be able to help you out with that rather than um, doing it on the live here. Um, so, Laurie on Insta is going, um, oh sorry, Chanel wants to know how frequently do you have to clean the inside of the hive? Okay, the great thing for us is the bees do a great job of keeping the inside of the hive clean. So you really have to clean the inside of the hive unless something's happened like the colonies died out or the hive beetles have taken over or something like that, in which case you might need to give it all a good clean and put a new colony in. Uh, so that's a fantastic thing, like the bees are looking after everything in here. As soon as you take this box off though, and if you left it in the shed with honey in it, then the honey could go fermented and you might need to clean that out before putting it back on again. So there, there is some, some things like that. If you've got some old flow frames sitting around, a pressure washer is a great thing to blast all the old wax off, freshen them up, dry them out and put them back on again. And uh, there is some things to clean sometimes in the hive. I'm not seeing it here but sometimes the bees will block up this little leak back point in here because bees will be bees. We've got a little gap there so any ha remaining honey will dribble through there and back to the hive to reuse. But bees will be bees and they'll block that up and if it's been sitting there for a long time it could go fermented or could go candied in there. You might need to just get your key like this, put a dishcloth on it and just wipe out that area there before you harvest. I rarely have to do that but it's a little tip if it is looking gunky in this area. Nice. Uh, BDJ on TikTok is asking, how do you look after a hive in extremely cold temperatures during winter in the north of the UK? So in cold climates, I'll, I'll uh, just clarify, I'm not an expert in cold climates, but if you have a look at the beekeeper.org, we've got some great videos on there with experts from all over the world, from different climates tuning in to share their knowledge. So you could have a look there. But what I do know about cold climates is what you're trying to do is get your bees to survive through the winter till the next time the flowers are out in the springtime. So the things you'll need to consider is enough forage for your bees, sorry, enough stored honey for your bees when there's no forage available for them. 
So there's different schools of thought on this. Some people like to take the flow frames off for the winter and just leave the bottom box, relying on there being enough honey stores on the edges of this for the bees to survive the winter. Or it is popular in those colder regions to put a, either a second honey super or a second brood box on which has a lot of honey stores on the edges as well. And that'll help your bees survive through the winter. If you want to leave it in this configuration over winter, then at a minimum, I suggest taking the excluder out. So that's the grid between the two boxes. The reason being is in those colder times, what happens is the bees together in a ball and they move up through the hive to consume honey as they go. And the queen could be left under the excluder because it's too big to get through. And then she might perish, not being able to keep warm with the other bees. And you start the next season without a queen. So at a minimum, you'd be taking that excluder out if you've got a long, cold, snowy winter ahead. Or you might decide to pack the hive down. If you've got several boxes, you might decide to take some of them off for the winter to reduce the area the bees need to keep warm over that time. And another little tip is stuff the roof cavity with an old pillow or some styrofoam from an old box and that'll just add some insulation in the roof area which will help your bees. It's not so important on the walls but under the roof it's good because you don't want condensation building up on the inner cover and dripping onto the bees. Condensation on the inner side of these panels is actually useful to bees in a long cold winter because they can use that as a water source. Great. Cedar, um, how much, how often do you harvest the honey in a 12 month period? So around here we could bank on a couple of times harvesting all the frames in a season. Some colonies will go hard in spring and collect an enormous amount of nectar and you can harvest more. And it also depends on you. Perhaps um, you're just happy uh, harvesting a bit of honey and leaving the majority of it there for the bees. However, in the springtime, it is a good idea to harvest the honey to make space for the bees to move honey up from downstairs in the brood box so the queen has more area to lay her eggs and that'll limit the chance of the hive swarming because after all, it, you, it's more preferable to keep your bees in your box rather than half of them flying off to start a new colony. Right. Now Jamie's um, in North Carolina and has ordered the Flow Hive 2, which is the one we are looking at now, the Hoop Pine or the Australian Aracaria. Jamie, Jamie's question is, will I need to put any finish on it or will it be fine left alone? So great question. We do recommend putting a good outdoor house paint on the Aracaria. Reason being is like most woods, except for Western Red Cedar in the world, outdoors they won't fare so well. Nature is trying to turn them back into the earth so if you get products that are made to, to make wood last a long time then that will help the longevity of your hive. If you don't put it on you'll likely see a whole lot of mildew after a while. It, let's say you've oiled it then the oils usually feed the mildew six months or, or so down the track and you start to get that mildew look. It doesn't really affect your hive so much, but it doesn't look so good. So we recommend an outdoor house paint on the Aracaria. And when it comes to the Western Red Cedar, then you've got choices of oils. That's an oiled one. We've moved away from that. It doesn't last as long. You do need to recoat regularly. You might need to recoat if you're using an oil every quarter or so to keep it looking good like that. Whereas the decking products, you might get a couple of years out of it looking like this because decking coats are made to keep wood looking good outdoors for a long period of time. So those are the ones we tend to turn towards for our cedar product. But the Aracaria, definitely a good idea to paint it. You can take some inspiration from this hive, get out there with your family, and this is another beautiful one here too, where Isabella's done this beautiful artwork that disguises the hive right into the garden here with the flowers. Isn't that beautiful? Fantastic Cedar. Does taking the um, Natura on TikTok is asking, does taking the honey out of the hive like this harm the bees in any way? 
So we've put a lot of effort into making sure our harvesting system is as gentle as possible for the bees. That was the whole idea in inventing it, was can't we just sit back and harvest the honey in a gentle, easy way while the bees do their thing. And I'm happy to say it, it works wonderfully well and that bees are much less likely to get harmed with our system than conventional honey harvesting. I used to do a lot of conventional honey harvesting. It's a big mess. You do end up unfortunately squashing a lot of bees. But uh, this method, as you can see, the bees have hardly noticed. We're even harvesting honey from the hive. So I'm very um, happy about how it works. And now we've got 100,000 or more flow hive beekeepers all over the world using the system. Great. Lacey's asking, would you recommend ad adding another brood box on top of the existing brood box before adding the super box for honey? Um, they live in very hot, long summers, wherever they are. So running two brood boxes. You certainly could. I'd recommend starting in this configuration first. The reason being is if you put another brood box, it may be all the colony needs and they won't get around to storing honey in your flow frames and you might get impatient and might not to get to, ha to harvesting honey in this easy gentle way so I recommend starting like this with a brood box and a super and then if you need to add another box wait till these are mostly filled and then add another brood box in between or on top depending on what you are achieving with that brood box. Great. Cedar, just back on that painting again, um, Adam's just wondering, um, is, is house paint all right for the hives and also for the hybrid hive as well, which is made out of the same timber as this hive, isn't it? Yes, good outdoor house paint is what you want, something that's going to last. We tend to leave the inside perfectly natural for the bees, but you can go ahead and paint that too if you want to. It is common in beekeeping in the commercial sector to dip the boxes in the strongest preservatives you can find and then do multiple coats inside and out of paint and the bees get along fine in that environment. However, we find a lot of the backyard beekeepers want to make the inside just natural wood as bees have always been in, in tree hollows. Now Clive's tuning in from Mullaney, which is not far from here, and of course they've had 12 weeks of non-stop rain, um, opened up the rear panel and it doesn't appear to have much honey in there at all and the bees cannot fly in the rain. Do you think they are using up the honey stores? Yes, most likely if they can't get out and do any foraging at all they will make do with the honey stores. Now if you can't see any honey stores at all and there's no breaks in the rain to even do a little bit of foraging then you might want to feed them just to Bring, uh, you know, string them along a little bit. At a guess I'd say it's not raining all day every day and there is time when the bees are flying in which case they should be fine this time of year in Mullaney. However if you're worried you can go ahead and make what you'd call a um, well you could either go thin syrup or thick syrup in this case because you're just trying to keep your bees alive keep them going so you're either going a one to one sugar to water ratio, cooking that up, or you can go two to one, two parts sugar, one part water, and that's a thick syrup. A thick syrup is designed to store like honey, so the bees will store their thick syrup as if it's already honey, and that's what people do prior to a winter to give them some honey stores. If uh, you're trying to stimulate the bees to get them going, what you're replicating is nectar with a one to one sugar to water ratio. A quicker and easy feeder is you get a Ziploc bag, you let that solution cool, put it in, put it up under the roof here, take the, the plug out of the inner cover, poke some pinholes in that bag, the bees will come up and they'll suck on that syrup and that'll be a quick and easy way to make a feeder. Or we do have videos showing you how to make various other types of feeders as well. Um, Jay Cousin is asking, how do you care for the Varroa with this flow hive system? Okay, that's a great question that we are all learning about here in Australia with Varroa now on our shores. We don't have Varroa mite in this area as yet to, to play with and hopefully we never do, but it's most likely that it's making its way up here as we speak. So 
What we do have though is a wealth of knowledge from just about every other continent which has the Varroa mite and there's all sorts of weird and wonderful ways to, to deal with them and make sure they don't get to levels that are going to take uh, a toll on your colony and, and uh, it can be the end of your colony. So there's various different ones that you can use in terms of chemical treatments. There's, there's harder chemicals which you can buy now here in Australia in the forms of strips you can put above the brood nest here in your hive to control the var varroa mite or there's um, ones like oxalic acid that people use around the world or formic acid people also use which uh, more towards the organic side and they do help to knock off a bunch of the mites and lower the population and there's also a lot of people working on genetics around the world after all if you can get the bees to look after the problem then we don't have to help with that so hats off to those people that are really working hard to breed varroa resistant bees as well. Right, Nashref was um, commented, had heard a comment from a, be a fellow beekeeper saying the hive has to be very strong to live on a flow hive as the bees don't like the plastic. So Nashref is like, is this true or not? It's uh, not true at all. Down here in the brood box we have conventional wooden frames. In fact, we're more natural than most beekeepers because we just supply the wooden frame and the bees hang their comb naturally from that. So it's wooden wax the way it's always been in a tree hollow, etc. And the bees can then size the cells from the, for themselves. They're building their own wax and they're doing their thing. Then we come along and put our invention on top, which is the partly made honeycomb matrix, which the bees attach to. Now, if they don't like it, then they wouldn't use it. But what we find is when the population's big enough, they very readily use it, like you can see here. And I, they will uh, get in there, join all the parts together, cover all of the parts in wax. So your honey's actually sitting, you can see the wax coating on the inside. So your honey's actually sitting in a little wax pocket inside the flow frames which is our invention and that just simply provides for that easy gentle harvesting like you see here. So it's, um, it is common to use plastic foundation in the brood box also. We don't supply that. If you want to try that you can. I like to leave it perfectly natural for the bees down here. Nice. So given it's the first day of spring um, in the US today, or tomorrow probably, is it? Their spring today? I don't know, anyway, <laughs> one of these days. Um, uh, what do you recommend to do for the start of the season? Okay, springtime in the US, it will really depend where you are. If you're uh, down south more so, then you'll have a temperate climate like us. Your bees will already be flying and you'll be underway with your season. So you'll be doing what's called your spring management where you're getting into the hives and checking on them and making some more space for the queen to lay to limit swarming and perhaps uh, you'll be doing whatever your preferred varroa treatment might be and that'll be the start of your area. If you're up north then you might be still waiting for the bees to start flying and once they start flying you can get in and do a brood inspection, check that you've still got a queen in your hive. If you haven't got a queen you might need to introduce one to get that hive going again for the season to come. So it really does depend whereabouts you are in the uh, continent there. Thanks Cedar. Um, now what Greg's asking what is the purpose of a second brood box? Why wouldn't you just add a second super instead? I don't add a second brood box, reason being is it's just a lot harder to do things like find the queen because you've got twice as many frames to look through to find her. So I like a single brood box. If you count all the cells in there, there is enough room for the queen to lay uh, a couple of thousand eggs a day and really max out with her egg laying. However, some people like to add a second brood box in the colder climates to get more honey stores for a winter to come and that way they might take their flow super off the top and leave two brood boxes which have the brood centered and honey on the edges so that that colony can use those stores to survive 
through the winter. In our area, we would tend to just keep it in this configuration or sometimes we'll put a second super on top if we do want to run a larger colony. Dominique's asking, this sounds like a good one, we might need photos of this because Dominique's saying has an old possum box that has been taken over by bees and he's hoping to transfer to a flow hive. The question is, do, do, do they need to move all the comb into the flow frames, into the frames? You will need to move the brood sections into the brood frame. So what you'll be doing is what's called a cutout. So we do have some videos where, where Pete Wilkins showed you how to do a cutout of a wall cavity. So it would be similar to that, except for not quite as daunting because you don't have to pull apart the wall. But what you'll want to be doing is cutting out the brood sections and using some rubber bands to put them into your wooden frames. And it'll temporarily be held by rubber bands going right around and that way the bees can then join around the edges onto the wooden frame and your brood will then all survive from there. And I wouldn't recommend putting too much honey or pollen stores. I would just take the brood. Reason being in this area, if you've got uh, possums, then you're probably somewhere where you've also got hive beetles, not sure. But hive beetles, if they are in your area, will tend to take over and seize the opportunity while the colony is trying to get on its feet after you've disrupted it so much and they might lay in the honey or pollen areas. So I'd really just focus on brood only and as many bees as you can get into the box. But have a look at the cutouts we've done for some inspiration. Um, Norelli's asking, I think, do most people build swarm boxes and use the flow high frames or do they purchase bees? That's a great question. If you could chime in and let us know how you got started. Did you purchase bees from a beekeeper? Did you take a split from a beekeeper? Did you catch a swarm or did you buy a package? And we're interested to know what you did with your hive to get going but they're basically the methods you'll be using to get started. If you've got a friend with bees, especially if it's spring or summertime when the bees are really breeding up, you'll actually be doing them a favour to take some of the brood frames out, put them into your hive. That'll free up space for the queen to lay in their hive, limit the chances of swarming, and you'll get to start your colony too. So that's a great way to start. Uh, otherwise, the easiest way is probably to buy a going little beehive called a nucleus off a bee breeder, often comes in a little core flute box. You could then situate that where you want in your garden, get a nice warm sunny day and grab your bee suit and smoker and gloves, transfer them into your brood box and they'll grow from there. Great and thanks Jamie for saying yesterday is the first day of spring. I should have listened to Sophie, she was all over it and I don't know what I'm just confused. Anyway, so do your beehive support other honeybees or is it just the regular American honeybee? Okay, it's actually the European honeybee that we're talking about here. They originated from Europe and humans have taken them all around the world wherever they've gone because they're such extraordinary little pollinators. A hive like this could pollinate 50 million flowers in a day, which is just wild, right? And also when the time's right and there's a lot of nectar, they can produce an extraordinary amount of honey. This is one single frame we've harvested and look at all this beautiful honey we've got. So the European honeybee, we've got a lot to thank for and they've really become an essential part of our food chain. And yes, it's the same species all around the world, Apis mellifera. There are other subspecies. There's Apis serrana, a Asian honeybee. There's Japonica in Japan, which is another variant of the Asian honeybee, and you can get them to use flow frames, but there's a few tricks to that because they generally like much smaller hives than these ones. There's also the Cape honeybee in South Africa, which is another variant, and people have successfully kept them in flow hives. But 99.99% .99 of our flow hive beekeepers are using the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. Right, Armadin's asking, how can I prevent them from being attacked by ants? That's a great question. So have a look down here at these 
legs. Now ants are an annoying thing. They're not detrimental to your hive, to your bees, but they just are a bit annoying when they get behind the covers. You go to take a cover off and there's a big ant nest behind it. Then what you want to do is brush all of those ants away using a bee brush or any kind of brush. Make sure you check behind this cover up here too and under the roof, brush as many away as you can. And then if you've got our ant guards, you can then fill them with oil, oil or, or some kind of uh, grease like Vaseline. And what you'll be doing is just winding them down like that and putting your oil or grease in there and then winding the cover down to keep the rain out. If you've got really tall ants or big ants, <laughs> then uh, <laughs> leave, the, leave it up a little bit. But if you've got smaller ones that are causing an issue, then you may as well pull it right down to be the best weather cover. And you'll find that if you go around and do that and you make sure no foliage is touching the hive and you brush them away a few times, the problem will go away for a while. Till next time, and you can repeat the process. Another little tip is if you don't have our ant guards you can either put little water moats like some people do or you can grab some cinnamon powder and throw it behind the covers. It does make it look a little bit dirty because cinnamon's brown but if you keep doing that you'll sufficiently annoy the ants enough to move on. Great now Vanessa did a first harvest on Monday and it was amazing but she had a lot of bees trying to dive into the honey um, and wondering how we get them to stay at the front of the bulk. Sounds like she needs some. Yes well it's just obedience really yeah. like um, <laughs> if you tell them to stay at the front. <laughs> no it's actually when the bees are hungry especially if they've got a taste for honey instead of flowers. Let's say some honey's been left out or you've accidentally left a frame leaning against the tree over there and the bees have got a taste for collecting honey instead of nectar then they'll be going like crazy for this jar and it happens every now and then that the bees get a taste for honey instead of nectar or they're just so hungry that some scout bees find this honey they go back into the hive they do a dance tell the hive that there's a great loot just around the back that they can go and get and that's when you get a lot of bees piling into your jar but you'll watch us harvesting and you rarely see many bees coming in. However, if you do get bees coming into your jar, simply cover that up with some netting or some kitchen wrap and that way you won't get bees piling into the jar. Now if the bees are really hungry, perhaps you shouldn't harvest too much of their honey. You can leave the rest for the bees and hopefully next time you come back there'll be more of a nectar flow on and your bees will behave themselves and not come around and jump in your honey jar. <laughs> We've got ours on little leads out the front of the <laughs> to stop. They're just not there. It's amazing. It just changes though sometimes, doesn't it, as you said, Cedar? And you know, some people grab the flow frames and they put the box on the other way around. I think if you were trying to do this right at the entrance, you'd be in a world oh, of trouble. <laughs> oh. You'd have a lot of bees in your jar, <laughs> yep. without a doubt. Um, Cedar, how far away can a hive be from your house? And, and positioning sort of tips for people who are setting up their hive as well. So this depends a little bit on your comfort level with bees and also the genetics of your colony. If you've got a very gentle hive then it's nice to have close. I've got one a few meters from my front door and it doesn't hassle anybody and the kids can be around it and it's fine. But I'm an experienced beekeeper and I know that and I can keep an eye, let's say, if the genetics changed because they raised a new queen, I would know pretty quickly and I'd move that hive further away. So if you have an aggressive colony, it's good to have it uh, where people aren't likely to walk in front of it or come into contact with it. What I'd recommend is uh, gentle genetics by when you order your bees, you get them off a bee breeder who's breeding for nice gentle behaviour. It makes it a joy to inspect your colony and learn about the bees and uh, also m makes it um, nicer to be around the hive. Perhaps you're weeding around it and you don't um, necessarily uh, want to be in your bee suit every time. However, if you're new to beekeeping, when you're around your hive, wear your bee suit, wear your gloves, protect yourself until you really know their temperament 
of your bees and how they behave. That way you'll get a gentle start in beekeeping. That's more enjoyable than getting a whole lot of stings. And also bear in mind some people have allergic reactions to bees like people do have to peanuts and so on. So in a rare case there's something called anaphylaxis and uh, I'll let you have a look at the first aid resources on that. But that's something to bear in mind uh, with bees, like um, also with nut allergies and so on. Um, it's a long answer, but I'm comfortable having bees very <coughs> close to the hive, and a lot of people are. But you'll need to um, think about, I guess, the flight path of the bees. So if you've got them really close to your house, then point the flight path away from where visitors are coming to, to walk to your house. Um, now Happy Hounds, an island, is asking, do you ever have to strap these hives down in stormy weather? You know, we get incredible winds up this slope here. Uh, sometimes, you know, 80 kilometres an hour. And what we did find with the classic hives is sometimes the roof would blow off, it would leave the inner cover in. So when it came to the Flow Hive 2, which is this one, we changed the roof design so it didn't blow off in those strong winds and we also put locks on the side that you can screw in to even lock it down, which we rarely use because the roofs don't seem to blow off anymore. The hives themselves, if they're full of honey, they're very heavy and the bees have stuck them together with their propolis. So what you get is, is uh, a very stable, uh, I guess, hive that doesn't tend to tip over in strong winds unless you've got it on an unstable footing. The caveat on that is if you've just put the super on top and they haven't glued it together with their propolis, you could get the, the boxes separating if there was a really strong wind but generally, we don't bother tying them down at all. Great, um, if Burke's asking, I badly want to start beekeeping, but live in the city, is that possible? Absolutely, so city beekeeping is very popular and people keep bees even on rooftops if they don't have a yard. They keep bees on balconies, all sorts of things. My sister kept bees in Berlin, she had four hives on her balcony right in the middle of the city and it's a wonderful place to keep bees because you get so many uh, different flavours of nectar coming in, so many floral sources from the things that people plant all through the city. It's said that bees actually do better in the city than in the farmland because of the variety of forage they can find for a longer period in the season and you get some, some great honey. So, so uh, one of the amazing things I think about beekeeping is it's a piece of farming that humans often yearn to do, that you can create a real amount of produce in a very small footprint. So the whole harvesting process used to take up a, a room in your house or your garage or your workshop when extracting honey in conventional ways. Now, this is it. This is all you need to harvest a real amount of produce from your hive or from your balcony. And it doesn't take up a lot of space. Yeah, it's so true. And Greg also tuned in on that one and said also um, good to check with your local council and as different councils have different rules too, depending on where you are. True, good point. Thanks, Greg. Um, now Debbie and Bega is saying Debbie's got an old dirty old frame, a brood frame, and was put in the freezer, but it's 80% full of pollen. She wants to cut it out and put the dirt, um, cut out the dirty wax, but there's a, is there a way she can feed the pollen back to the bees? So if you want to feed the pollen back to the bees, the best thing to do would be to leave it in the frame it's in, take it out of the freezer, thaw it out, and put that back on the edge of the hive. The bees will consume that pollen and they'll start putting honey stores in that frame and then you can take it out when it's only honey. Uh, or you could just ditch it and put the blank frame back in so you can cut that out, compost it, keep it away from bees and put the frame back in the centre for them to draw some new wax and start storing some fresh pollen. Good. What maintenance is needed on the flow hive, Cedar? So 
Over time, like any wooden products outdoors, you'll need to do some maintenance. Now we do recommend a good uh, outdoor house paint and that'll give you a longest lasting on the Aracaria wood. For the cedar, then we do recommend putting decking products on if you want to keep it looking like wood or you could also paint it as well. You'll need to maintain the coating on your hive every year or two to keep it looking good because nature is trying to turn wood back into the earth so there will be some maintenance you'll need to do to keep it looking good for the long haul. In terms of the flow frames themselves we have people chiming in that have had them five years, seven years, eight years now already and they're still going strong so hopefully your flow frames will, will get you through many many seasons of, of harvesting honey and after about five years, we do find some people would like to give them a good clean. So pulling these frames out of the hive, you harvest the honey and you get a pressure washer and blast all the old wax off, dry them out and put them back in again. Or if you connect a hot water hose to your pressure washer, then that's even better, You're really melting a lot of the wax off and you can get this window looking a lot better again too. This one's been used for a number of seasons and you can see it's getting getting a bit of build up here so you can blast a lot of that away and you get a, a better view again of what the bees are up to in the hive. In terms of maintenance for the pest management tray we do have a tray down the bottom here that you can um, uh, slide out and what you'll be doing from time to time depending on whether you've got hive beetles in your area or varroa you'll be using that pest management tray to uh, catch the beetles by putting some oil or detergent and water which we showed you last week in that tray you can catch a whole lot of hive beetles or you might be using that space for a sticky board to count varroa mites to help you guide whether you need to do any treatment to your hive so that can be used in a number of ways for pest management but you will need to clean that tray out after it rains. There might be a whole lot of water that's blown in the front and gone down through the screen, or just because there's a lot of old bits of wax and debris that are building up in there, and you can just clean it out quickly by scraping it out with your hive tool and putting it back in again. So I think there's not a whole lot of maintenance. The maintenance to, I guess, produce ratio can often be quite low and it's not like uh, some animals like chickens and things where you need to be there to shut them away at night and check on them. They can go for months at a time without your input. Right, Caden's asking, is it better to keep the hive in a more shady spot or in a spot with more direct sunlight? If it's a choice between full shade or full sun, I would always go full sun because it helps keep pathogens like chalk brood away from uh, building up in the brood nest down here. If you've got an afternoon shade in summer and sunny the rest of the time then that would be absolutely perfect. So if you've got a tree you can position your hive near where the shadow will come across it in the afternoon you'll be giving your bees a helping hand to, to let that hive cool down on those hot summer afternoons but they will be fine in the full sun in a really hot summer also. Cedar Daniel wants to know, does the entrance to the beehive need a certain amount of space for the bees to be able to navigate towards it? Well, it needs to be big enough for a bee to fit through, but that's about it. And the minimum gap for a, a, a queen bee to go in and out is 4.3 millimetres. So it has to be at least that. The gap that we've got at the entrance is about 9 millimetres, which is less than a lot of conventional Langstroth hives and there's a reason for that and that means uh, in countries where you've got long cold winters and mice trying to infest into the bottom it's hard for them to get in and it also helps them keep pests like wasps away if the entrance is smaller and we've even got an entrance reducer to make it even smaller again if you've got pests like the yellow jackets that we don't have in Australia but you have in Europe and you have in North America that might get in and decimate some of your bee colony. So if you jump up here you can see the entrance where they're going in and out. We've got some strategic things happening here with a bit of a a sloped landing board and then a sloped uh, piece of 
aluminium where they go in to help guide the water away from going in. However, driving rain coming up this hill sideways will blow into the hive, but it doesn't matter too much because it goes straight through our screen bottom board into the tray below. So we've done a bit of work on, on the entrance there and it works really nicely and I think it's about the right size, doesn't need to be any bigger and usually it doesn't need to be much smaller. Great, and Cedar, you sort of answered that question because we had another question about the yellow jackets, but I'm also thinking that maybe the question was also to do with how close, say, to a fence or something like that for the bees coming in. Or so, if you've got a fence and you put the entrance pointing right towards it, that's okay, the bees will work it out. But what it will mean is the bees will come enthusiastically out of your hive and then have to fly away from the fence so they'll be coming back past you here while you're trying to harvest your honey which might not matter too much but it's just something to bear in mind if that's all you've got as an option in your backyard then you'll make do but if you can get a couple of meters out in front for the bees to get up and away then they're less likely to be around the back here getting in your hair and in your honey jar Right. Jamie, um, you were mentioning before Cedar about maintenance on the hive and Jamie's wondering if you are repainting or staining your hive every year, will the fumes affect the bees if, the, if it's full of bees? You know bees are quite resilient to fumes. Once they've set up shop and they've got their brood in there it's very hard to get them to go. So commercial beekeepers will use the cheapest uh, paint they can find and the strongest preservatives they can put on their wood and the bees do just fine. However, we like to keep it perfectly natural for the bees on the inside just to mimic tree hollows and we paint the outside to really uh, give it a long lasting weather coat. I find, but suit yourself here and protect yourself if you're new to beekeeping, wear your bee suit, wear your gloves and you can touch up the paintwork with the bees in the hive. And the time I'd recommend to do that would be earlier in the morning when there's less bees flying around the entrance. So you can also touch up that area. Great. Cedar, are there any particular flowers that you think are good to plant around the hive or any that you shouldn't plant around the hive? Now, we plant flowers around the hive for the reason, apart from it looking beautiful, it's to attract the native bees. and while the European honeybees in your hive will go for them and forage on them like, like you'll probably see here, there's, there's not enough to actually get a real amount of honey or, or nectar to create honey. So you'll actually need to plant acres of forage in order to really change your honey crop. But the reason we like to plant them is you get all of these native species coming in, which is a real joy and a piece of education as well. You get the blue banded bee and they love these purple flowers and they've got blue stripes on them and they're just incredible little ones. You've got the teddy bear bees here, which is another native Australian solitary bee. You've got the fire-tailed resin bees, which is an iconic species that likes to nest in the boards on the side of your house. And uh, in all sorts of places and that collects resin to make its nest. So just by planting forage and creating a little bit of habitat, sometimes these solitary native species will only be foraging a few hundred metres and that will provide them another stepping stone to then travel a further afield and you never know, you planting forage in your yard and creating some habitat might even help save some of these species from the brink of extinction as we connect corridors through cities and connect wild spaces together again. See, do the bees have a favourite spot in the hive to be eating the honey from? Favourite spot in the hive to eat honey? I would say it is as close as to the brood nest as they can get because they will use quite a lot of honey to feed to the young larvae. So, that's why sometimes when you are inspecting your flow frames, if you pull them out, you might find 
right above the brood nest, they've eaten a bit of a, an arc. So an arc shape of honey right here on these central frames is something common to find when the bees are hungry and they're not bringing in enough forage. So when they're storing honey, they'll start central and work out towards the extremities. When they're eating honey, they'll start central above the brood nest and also uh, work their way out. So sometimes you'll find that you harvest some honey from the central frames and you don't get as much from them and you're wondering what's going on. It's probably that the bees have eaten a whole lot out just above the brood nest. And in time when the flowers flower again, the nectar is present, they'll fill that in again. See, this is a good one from Robbo on TikTok. Just wondering, do the bees get to know the beekeeper and act less aggressive than if it was a stranger? Many beekeepers say that yes, they get to know them and they claim that the bees know them. Well, I'm not sure about this. Let me know, chime in. <laughs> is it a beekeeping myth or is it fact? There has been studies done that bees can tell the difference between Van Gogh and Dali's artwork. And that's been proven that they do have that level of recognition. So it is possible for your bees to get to know you, but bear in mind that a worker bee might only be alive for say four to six weeks and it'll only be in part of that life that its job will be guarding the entrance. So even if you think your bees know you, in a few weeks time they would have forgotten. <laughs> oh, It's great, I read a book about that Cedar and actually it was like when, the, when a, in certain places when beekeepers die they would put like covers over the hives and there's been stories of like, I know in the same book, I can't remember what it was called, it was fantastic, where the beekeeper had died and then all the bees came and sort of congregated over the, the, the grave. Have you ever heard of that? It's common in many cultures. Bees have been a very revered uh, thing because of their amazing uh, produce they can make and the pollination work they do that bees have been used in all sorts of ceremonial purposes and in Egypt honey was put into clay pots and buried in the tombs 3,000 years later the honey was still good so honey is incredible and bees are incredible and it's no wonder humans have made them a part of ceremonial rituals fantastic and Fred Dunn's tuning in and answering lots of questions today so hi Fred thanks for that Thanks Fred. Fred's a, a wealth of knowledge. He's got a great YouTube channel with all sorts of things he's experimenting with. He's a great knowledge in beekeeping. Thanks Fred for tuning in and helping answer all of the great questions that are coming through. Um, now the Queen, Beb, is saying, I have bees between the house and my chimney outside. How do I get them out and keep them all alive? House and the chimney. Okay, the, the bees are in the chimney. So um, uh, you do need to make a serviceable hive. As tempting as it is, you could just knock a few bricks out, jam a few flow frames in and harvest honey straight out of your chimney. It's actually illegal in most jurisdictions to keep bees like that. And what you'll need to do is somehow get in there and remove the bees, just like doing a cutout. We'll put some links below of us doing cutouts where we're taking apart a wall and you'll be getting the brood sections and as many bees as you can, rubber banding the brood into the frames, putting them in your box, shaking all the bees in and then trying to limit their access back into the, the chimney there and hopefully then the bees will be in your box instead of in the chimney but it can be a bit of a challenge if it isn't possible to get in there and remove the bees. There's a little tip that my brother uses it is an arborist where if you've got bees in an area like in a tree hollow and you've got to go up there and prune that tree then what they'll do is go up and throw in a cattle tick ear, ear tag or cat and dog flea collars. The, the, the cattle ear tags are stronger and if you throw that into the area it won't kill the bees but it will annoy them sufficiently that they'll pack up shop and leave 
and find a new home. It might take six weeks for them to leave though. <laughs> Fantastic. Clive's wondering they've viewed quite a lot of blue banded bees in their garden and wondering if there could be like a nest or a hive nearby. So at my children's school I saw the most amazing sight with literally thousands of blue banded bees nesting in a mud brick wall that the children had made. So blue banded bees nest in mud but they are solitary and you usually only see one or two nests in an area of mud perhaps under your house or somewhere in a sheltered area. However sometimes like we saw you can get a lot of them so it appears like they're a hive but they're not. They're actually a single bee laying eggs in a single hole in the mud and raising a few young like that. So you're unlikely to, to have, um, well you won't have a colony or a nest like this, you'll have just solitary bees finding a hole in mud. Thanks. Timothy's wondering will bees help or even have an effect on pollinating trees? Absolutely. So most species of tree need pollination to occur and there's parts of the world that don't have enough pollinators, not enough native pollinators, not enough honeybees to do the pollination and you really see the effects of those trees not setting enough seed. So it's important to have enough pollination whether it be native species or the European honeybee to pollinate not only our food crops but also our wild spaces and our trees and so on. Now it's uh, we've come to a point where the honeybee has now been tangled up with our food chain so it's super important that we have enough honeybees to do enough po pollination and that we have enough beekeepers to look after enough honeybees. So super good thing to become a beekeeper. Fantastic. Um, just wondering, oh, well you haven't done it yet, but they want to, um, Demir's tuned in and said, can you show us how you will replace the tube out and put the plug back in once you finish harvesting the honey? Well, let's show you that right now. So I put the little caps in the caddy here in this little tray, which is a good spot to do it. I used to put them in the garden, but there's probably many buried in the mulch there. So all we need to do, because the honey flow has now slowed down to the point where it's only dripping. I can leave the rest for the bees because I'm just going to hot swap this for that cap and that was nice and clean and neat and now the harvesting uh, has finished although we have not switched the frame off yet. So a little tip here is you can lean the, this lip here which is the piece that unblocks what's called the leak back point each time you harvest. You can lean that right there on your jar for the remaining honey to go in. Um, except you need enough honey down the right end for it to balance. There we go. And now you can get your key and what you're going to do is put it in the top slot. See how there's two slots up here? It's going to be the top one. And you need to push it all the way till you feel it hit the back and then turn it to a 90 like that. It's easier to turn on the way back so you can do it all in one go and if you can leave that for a minute or two so that all your frame parts move back into position. If you do a quick close and walk away you might find the parts didn't quite seat down and you could get problems later from wonky shaped cells and wax build up here causing spillage in the hive. So leave it there for a minute or two while you pack up some things and then you can come and take the key out and put it back in your caddy. Now one thing you'll find is I can almost feel the resistance on here that it still hasn't all been pushed down enough. It's quite springy still so I'm going to leave it there a bit longer. So you can use that to get the feel of whether all your parts have pushed down into their correct position. And all you need to do is replace this top cap, put this cover back and job is done. Don't forget to put the side windows on because 
you don't want a whole lot of sunlight getting in, warming up your hive, you want to make sure you've got your covers on. And this is a beautiful artwork here by Sarah, who's an amazing artist we have in the house. And it's um, incredible, this educational piece she's done here. Look at that, it is beautiful. And on the other side, we've got the difference between the worker, queen and drone down the bottom. And up the top, we have the life cycle of the bee as it's growing through the larval stage. Thanks so much for tuning in. We've got time for another question as we wrap up this honey harvest. Well, this is a couple of people are asking, and Timothy is asking on Facebook, I think TikTok's maybe wound up now, saying, um, how long did it take for that frame to fill up with honey? So the answer is it really depends. The bees can be very fast, especially in the springtime. Perhaps you've harvested your, all of your frames. Two weeks later, they're full again. In Canada, we get people that boast a whole hive fills up in a single 24 hour period. Hard to believe, I've never seen anything like that. The fastest I see it here is a week. They would have filled up a whole box. But don't get your expectations set so high. Sometimes you might not get any honey in a whole season because the bees are only finding enough to support themselves. Or perhaps your colony is a bit weak. Perhaps their flowers didn't flower this year and so on. So if you get a good harvest where you can harvest all the frames in the season, then you're usually very happy. And we find around here, as a rule of thumb, as an average, we can harvest all of these frames probably twice throughout the year. Here we have about 20 kilograms of honey. So you get two big buckets of honey or about uh, 50 of these jars if you harvest all your frames. So such an extraordinary amount of honey from a single bee colony. They are an extraordinary species that we now very much rely on in our food chain and they do this beautiful byproduct of incredible honey that we can take to the kitchen table. Thanks so much for tuning in. All your great questions. Let us know what you'd like us to cover next week. Have a look at the beekeeper.org if you really want a educational course that's made to take you from square one right through to even a deep scientific knowledge in beekeeping. Experts from all over the world, including Fred Dunn, who was just tuning in answering, have made great content at thebeekeeper.org. It's free to try and also a great fundraiser. We've planted a million trees last year, half a million this year in high quality ecosystems for the bees. And we continue to support all sorts of great initiatives to uh, help the plight of the bee in the world. So thank you very much for all those that are involved at thebeekeeper.org. Have a look if you do want that uh, deep video training and also written training in beekeeping. Gets rave reviews, so let us know what you think. And also, if you've got the answers to people's questions, chime in, it's fantastic to see all of you chiming in, helping answer people's questions. It's such a, an amazing community uh, all over the world, and I've learned so much from you all as well. <laughs>